In this first video, we're going to introduce variational methods, and I'll even discuss a little bit about the history to give some context and background to the development of these very useful and important methods in the physical sciences and engineering. So we're going to discuss actually these first two sections, a bit of history and an introduction. And then in the following few videos, we're going to look at some motivational examples. I want to show you by example from physical problems, optimization problems, where this variational method comes from, where the need arises actually for us as scientists and engineers to be able to solve problems using these variational techniques. So let's just briefly think about how the mathematics that we have today, how has it come about? Where has it come from? The way we're taught mathematics and the image that we get in terms of how it must have been developed is that there's layers and layers of theorems and proofs and theorems and proofs. And we say that if we have a theorem that proves A is true, and then another theorem that proves B is true, and then another theorem that says if A and B are true, then C has to be true. And we build up mathematics layer by layer. And in fact, that is true for certain branches of mathematics, that they've arisen out, arisen out of consideration of the theoretical consequences, the mathematical consequences of certain known mathematical theorems. More often than not, however, new branches of mathematics have come about because applied mathematicians, smart individuals, scientists, ran into a problem. They're trying to explain something, understand something, and they didn't have the mathematics to do it, that they didn't have the mathematical language vocabulary to express or to understand or to predict some physics. And so they ended up developing the mathematics that was necessary to do that. There's probably no greater example of this than the calculus of variations. The origins of the calculus of variations were very much rooted in some historical figures whose names you've heard before, but who had some very specific problems they wanted to solve, but the tools in their mathematical toolbox that they had at the time were not sufficient to do that. And so they had to actually develop the new mathematics in order to solve those problems. This is described in the section of the book on a bit of history. I'm not going to say too much about that in the video, just to say that this is during the period of the late Renaissance and the Age of Enlightenment, so the late 1600s and the 1700s. This is a time period in history when a lot of things were coming together, not just science and mathematics, but a lot of other human endeavors that we were involved in, and a great deal of interest in understanding universal truths uh, about the world in which we live, the universe in which uh, we exist. And so scientists and mathematicians were really trying to get at the root of explaining the universe as it is. And there was a, a real emphasis on reality in art, architecture, science, and so forth. And that's the time period in which the calculus variations was developed, as was the case for many other mathematical fields as well, including complex variables, differential calculus, as well as differential equations. So this was a very rich time in uh, the science and mathematics communities. This is when the scientific method was instigated by Isaac Newton and so many of these wonderful uh, great names that we're familiar with, Leonard Euler and Leibniz and so forth, did their, did their work. The point here is that the origins of this calculus, I'll sometimes refer to it as the new calculus, it's not new obviously, and it's not even necessarily newer than differential calculus that were developed around the same time, actually by some of the same people. But I'll call it the new calculus at times because the differential calculus that we're familiar with, I'll, I'll sometimes refer to that as the old calculus. So this is the new calculus. So this new calculus, the calculus variations, really comes out of its application-driven roots. And that remains true today. It's a powerful set of mathematical tools that allows us to look at, address, understand, analyze, and predict the world in which we live, a lot of the physical principles that we are familiar with. So let's look at some of the applications of the calculus of variations. These are all covered in the book, some of which we'll cover in these videos, some of which we will not, but they're, they're in the book if you're interested in, in seeing more. So there's classical mechanics. The term classical, the way we use it in science and engineering is it's something old and still useful. You think of classical music, it's old music, but it's still useful. The way we actually use that term is to refer to all of mechanics basically before Einstein. Anything starting with Einstein and after that we call modern physics. So topics like special relativity, general relativity, quantum mechanics, those are what we call modern physics. Of course, that was over 100 years ago when uh, Einstein did his his amazing work, so it's maybe not so modern anymore, but it's, that's the way we refer to it. Classical mechanics, that's things like statics, 
dynamics of rigid and deformable bodies, stability of dynamical systems, optics, electromagnetics, these were all things that were developed up through and including the 1800s that preceded the modern physics that, that Einstein introduced in the early part of the 1900s. Fluid mechanics, which is my primary area of interest, has a number of very interesting applications and uses of calculus of variations. And one of the biggest areas, in fact, all of part three, a whole third of the book is dedicated to optimization and control of these physical systems that we as scientists and engineers care about. So we're all the time trying to understand how can we design and build and operate systems in an optimal way? How can we achieve some objective in the best way possible? How can we minimize the cost of building and maintaining such a system. So this is extremely important and extremely relevant in today's science and engineering. So things like shape optimization. So if you're an aerospace engineer, you're trying to design, say, the wing shape for a new airplane, and you want to maximize the lift and minimize the drag. So you're trying to optimize uh, the shape in that way. Financial optimization, there was actually a Nobel Prize in economics that was given in the 1970s for someone who used variational methods to optimize taxation. So their, their goal was to determine how can I tax people to get as much out of people as possible by taxing them without discouraging them from actually working and so on. So someone got a Nobel Prize for using variational methods to do financial optimization. And we'll focus uh, in our videos on control of discrete and continuous systems. So these are the systems that we as engineers and scientists would be interested in, interested in controlling, and doing so in some optimal way. There's also a number of numerical methods that are either based on variational methods or use variational methods. The finite element method, which is a very popular and common method used all throughout engineering and many of the sciences, is based on variational principles. And some of you are thinking, wait, I've, ha I've read books, I've taken courses on finite element methods, and there's been no mention of variational methods. Well, You've heard of the strong form and the weak form. The strong form is the differential form. The weak form is actually the variational form. They may not have used that term, but that's what it represents. Uh, essential natural boundary conditions, that terminology all comes from variational methods. So the mathematical foundation is actually variational methods, even if that's not the way it's always being taught today. And there's other numerical methods here as well. Image processing and data analysis, so splines and uh, proper orthogonal decomposition, and there's many techniques that we use to process images, to process signals, some of which, not all of which, but some of which are based on variational techniques. So the first part of the book is gonna focus on variational methods themselves. Chapter two really contains the mathematical background and methods for doing calculus of variations. And then all of part two is focused on applying variational methods to physical systems and processes. The beauty of part two is we're gonna encapsulate a whole host and a wide range of different physical phenomenon, from engineering to science to classical mechanics to modern physics and a, and a number of other areas, including fluid mechanics, my area, all within one umbrella, and that is the Hamilton's principle, which is a variational principle that unifies so many of the physical principles that we're familiar with, including Newton's second law, as well as many others. And then all of part three is gonna focus on the optimization and control of those systems. So both the physics behind how the system behaves, as well as our ability to control it in an optimal fashion, are both based on variational principles. And so this is gonna be a really unifying, you're gonna hear me say this term over and over again, unification of these principles within this variational framework. And the reason for this is because so many fundamental principles of physics both classical and modern, are expressed in terms of extremum principles. An extremum is a minimum or a maximum. And it's really in these extremum principles where the calculus of variations supplies this really powerful and unifying mathematical framework that is just tailor-made for treating these, these types of problems. So I'm going to focus on three themes throughout the book, and I'm, I'm going to mention these as we go uh, when they arise. But there's three themes, and I want to tell you right off the bat what they are so you can watch for them as you go through the set of videos or if you read the book. So the first thing that I'm going to emphasize is that when we formulate many problems in science and engineering from first principles, which I'll explain in a moment, we end up getting a variational form. 
the most natural way to mathematically express the physical principle is in a variational form. And that's very often the case. In fact, this is what we're going to look at in two, our first two motivational examples that you'll see in the next section. Now, what I mean by first principles is these are the foundational principles of science. So these are the things like first law of thermodynamics, energy is conserved. So these are the things that are so fundamental to the truths and the principles that we base all of our science and engineering on. So the second theme that I want to emphasize is that whereas we often have a differential as well as a variational formulation of these physical principles, we're generally more familiar with the differential formulation. Here we're going to introduce the variational formulation. And what I want to show you is that the variational formulation often gives you more physical insight, additional physical insight, as compared to the differential form. So even though we're more often more familiar with the differential form, the variational form is often going to give us more insight physically into the underlying physics. We'll get a better intuition, a clearer intuition about the underlying physics of the problem. So you'll see that in a number of ways uh, throughout the book. The third theme that I want to emphasize is that the variational approach to optimization and control supplies the most general and formal framework within which to look at a whole host of optimization control problems. So once again, uh, I just want to emphasize, and I'll do this over and over again, this unifying variational framework, both in terms of understanding, explaining, predicting systems, the systems that we care about, as well as the optimization and control framework that we use to optimize their behavior.